Who is God? And can we truly know him? Over the last 2,000 years, we've tried to envision him, sometimes even to the point of contorting him to fit into our box. Because of our limited imagination, we can fail to grasp a limitless God. A God who is three distinct persons, but yet one. Not only a Father, but a Son and a Holy Spirit. But can we truly know who God is? Can we relate to Him and trust Him the way a child trusts a father? As deep cries to deep, we all long to connect with our Creator. Knowing who God is doesn't just depend on us. He has already made a way for us to know Him. What if He can be known by His voice and His Spirit and His Word and His creation? God is beyond our imagination, yet He invites us to come to Him, to know Him, and to walk with Him. This is how we truly come to know who God is. So I've learned something about life, and it's this, that life is full of a lot of uncertainties and unknowns, and we don't really like that. <laughs> we want to know what's before us. We want to know where we're going to be in 10 years, and if I do these certain things, I will get to this point. And life just kind of chuckles at that. Because there's obstacles and issues and things we face. There's so many unknowns, things that are outside of our control that we face in life. If it was up to us as we go through life, we'd have a map laid before us with a route. And I'm talking like pre-smartphone, like a real map laid out that has a route that we would take to go through life to get where we want to go. But that's not how life works. Instead of a map to follow, we have more of something like a compass. A compass tells you simply what direction you're facing, what direction you're headed. And this is really more what God has given us in life. And metaphorically, the compass can represent everything that you believe and feel and everything you know, really how you view life. What you set your life on and towards is the direction you're going to go in. It's the compass that you're following with your life. Instead of a map, we have a compass. And when it comes to following God, if you are a Christian, a believer, a follower of God, you would hopefully say that your compass is oriented around God, that God is your north that you are following in life. But what if your compass isn't quite pointing to the right north? What if it isn't quite pointing to God like you think it is? You see, many of us have incorrect views or misunderstandings of God and who he really is. And so when we seek to follow God and follow that north that we've set to, we may think we're going the right direction, but it might take us a different route. You may not realize this, but compasses have actually been around quite a long time. In the 11th century is when they were first developed, so like a thousand years ago, primarily for sailors to use out on the open seas. Because sailors, when they're out there, they would use stars at night, particularly the North Star, to know which way was north and which way they were going. But that doesn't work very well during the day or on a cloudy night. And so they developed a compass by detecting the magnetic core of the earth and all the science stuff that I don't understand. But by detecting it, detecting it, a compass will tell you which way is north. But an interesting thing happened over time. Sailors realized that the north of their compass wasn't aligned with the North Pole or the North Star, what they would see. So scientists went all over the world, did a bunch of tests, and they determined that the magnetic core that the compass goes off of is not quite pointing to the North Pole. The North Pole is a fixed geographic point on the Earth. It is what North is. No matter where you are, you can point to the North Pole. That is North. But a compass points to the magnetic North, which is slightly off and actually changes over time. So what sailors realize is that their North was not true North. And so when we seek to follow God, our understanding absolutely matters because it's the direction that we set our life on. And if we have an incorrect view we're following something slightly different and off. It may seem like a small thing, but over time, it can lead us somewhere else that we don't want to go. So in this series, we are talking about some of these big misunderstandings or issues that many of us have when it comes to following God. And here's today's that I think really a lot of us have been stuck in and maybe not even realizing, and it's this, the view that God is angry. Many of us, when we think of God, when we think of following God, we think that God is angry, that God is mad, that God hates me, and I'm really a failure, I'm inadequate, and if I mess up, then God's going to smite me. It's the only time we use that word smite. 
when we think of God as angry at us. You got to wonder, where does this view come from? I think there's a lot of different ways that we get with this perspective, but I got four right here. I think four main ones. One is just simply a poor Christian witness. As Christians, primarily uh, teachers, people in churches, or individuals holding signs on the road that portray an inaccurate or incomplete view of God. And it warps and people think then that God is just angry all the time. Or it can be from our parents. Whether you grew up with Christian parents around Christianity or not, if you had very authoritarian parents or maybe some other kind of figure in your life, that can then shape and change in how you view God and you think God is angry with you because your parents are angry all the time. And we've got to realize that and own it. Or it can come from our own guilt and shame, things that we've struggled with that we know are wrong, and we think, God knows that, so God must hate me. Or just from misunderstanding the Bible. You look at one passage in the Old Testament, there's, there's several that talks about the anger of God, and you think, well, God must be angry all the time then. So maybe it's one of these that has shaped your perspective or something else. But, but through this, I, I want to dig into this question. And really by doing so, looking at the Bible, because the Bible is God's word where he's revealed himself to us in it. And I want to answer the question, is God angry? And and, and simply the answer when you look at the Bible is yes and no. (laughs) It's not a simple no, let's just talk about God's love and move on. There is anger of God that we see in scripture. So we're going to dig into this to answer this question. And I want to do this from different perspectives. And the first is from our head. Just logically, what can we know about the anger of God? How does that fit with his love and his mercy and everything we see in the Bible about God? And then I want to answer it from our heart. Because you can know the right answer, but you can still have emotional struggles with it. So I want to speak to our hearts. And lastly, I'll end by talking about our hands, the way forward. What do we do with this? It's from our head to our heart to our hands. And as a disclaimer, I'm going to spend about 85% of the time on the head. We're going to get into a whole bunch of scriptures to, to paint this picture, to understand accurately who God is. So let's dig in first with the head. And what we are doing in this study is we're talking about theology. Theology simply means the study of God. It's our knowledge of God. And so we really all, all of us are theologians. We all have a perspective, an understanding. We have a belief system about God. Some of us just have good theology and some of us have bad theology. So we're teaching good theology in this. But when it comes to theology, there's different types or different methods of studying God. You may not know this. There's historical theology, biblical theology, practical theology, systematic theology, and many more what these different methods or areas of study, they use different data or research methods to to put it together to understand God. And they all work together to give us a complete picture of God. So today, and what we're really doing in most of this series is talking about systematic theology. And there's plenty of huge books you can read on this, but systematic theology, what it does is looks at the whole teaching of the Bible and puts it together like, like puzzle pieces to get an understanding of God. So for example, Pastor John last week talked about the Trinity. Now, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. There's not one passage we go to that teaches us the Trinity. There's all these different things that talk about God being triune in his nature of three in one and God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We put that together through systematic theology to have an understanding of the triune nature of God. That's systematic theology. So when we talk about the anger of God, you can do what is called proof texting, which is just grab one part of scripture and say, ah, this proves it. God is angry because this one part talks about the anger of God but that doesn't give you a full understanding of the anger of God or how God is angry or not. So we're going to do a systematic approach to understand the anger of God and what that really means and why I can say yes and no that God is angry. And so there's different parts we got to look at. The first is this, the holiness of God, that God is holy. 1 Samuel 2 verse 2 says this, There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. So God is holy in his nature. Holiness means set apart, different, completely other than the rest of creation that God created. God is holy and separated from that. We talk about holiness and our personal holiness that when we come to faith, we are set apart for God and we are seeking to grow towards him. But God in his nature always is holy, separate, completely other. That means that he is all-powerful, he is all-knowing, nothing is hidden from God. He is infinite and eternal, he has no beginning and no end, he is perfect, he is holy, he is completely separated from us. That means we cannot fully fathom God, we cannot put God into a box that he must obey, the confines that we give to him. God is completely holy and separate from that. The second thing we have to look at is this, that God is just. He is a holy and righteous God in his nature. 
Psalm 50, verse 6 says this, And the heavens proclaim his righteousness, for he is a God of justice. God is a just and righteous God. That's who he is in his nature, his characteristics as being just righteous. So that means that our understanding of right and wrong comes from the very nature and character of God. We oftentimes think of right and wrong and morality as some other standard that we hold God to. I say, well, no, God, that wasn't right. You didn't, you didn't meet my standard. And God says, no, 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 no. It comes from who he is. And he is holy and he is righteous. And ethics and morality come from the nature of God. He is our moral compass, if you will, to know what is right and wrong in life. God is just all the time. He is a righteous judge. And he is able then to enact justice as a holy and righteous God in who he is all the time, throughout all time. Because God does not change. So now looking at God's wrath. If you look through the Bible, you'll see times where it talks about God's anger, the anger of God, and also talks about the wrath of God. Much of the time, it's actually the same word. We just translate it differently to kind of have a distinct picture from humanity's anger. And I'll get to that in a bit. But really, the wrath of God, what that is, is the holiness and the justice, the righteousness of God working together. It's the, the holiness and the justice of God in action, if you will, is the wrath of God. And this is why. The essence of evil is rebellion or rejection against God. So sin, we talk about this, we defined it before, that it, the word sin in the Bible comes from an archery term that meant to miss the mark, that you missed your target. And to sin is to miss the way that God wants us to live, to, to go our own way. And that's in essence what it is. It's rejecting God in his way and saying, I know better, I'm going to do it my way. If you go all the way back in the beginning of the Bible, and Adam and Eve, when they first failed, they first sinned, they, they, they stepped away from God, they were choosing to be their own gods that they knew better, and they were going to use God's creation for their own way instead of honoring him as the creator and how he said to enjoy creation. That's what sin, that's what evil is. And now evil gets very perverse, perverse and horrid throughout the world, and we see all these terrible things that happen, and we tend to have our own right and wrong standards, so we kind of make it differently. But at its core, all evil is the same. It is rebellion and rejection against a perfect and righteous God. And he then is justified as righteous and holy to then enact a punishment to make it right. That is the wrath of God. Nahum 1 describes this well. It says this, The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and vents his wrath against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. So that's a very vivid picture. You know, we don't sing a lot of songs about that one right there. But that's the picture of God's anger and his wrath. And at the end it says that he will not leave the guilty unpunished. Because to leave the guilty unpunished would be unjust. We want criminals brought before a judge. We want things made right. And that's who God is and how he operates. That he is a just judge that will leave, not leave the guilty unpunished. So in the Bible, not in that particular passage, but other parts, particularly in the New Testament, the Greek word is used, orge, which means wrath and sometimes it's translated anger. And what it means is that it's the deep-seated anger of God against sin. And this anger arises from his holiness and his righteousness. And so what we need to understand is that God's anger is different from humans' anger. And the Bible uses the same word, but we translate it differently to show this. For example, in James 1, it says this, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. What he's saying is in contrast that God's anger does produce the righteousness that he desires because it stems from who he is as a righteous and holy God. So God's anger is not like humans. God's anger stems from his justice and his goodness. Our anger often stems from our selfishness, our desire to be in control, and our pride. And so we have an emotional outburst that is our anger. God's anger is not an emotional outburst. It is intentional and it is planned. And it is set against evil and sin in the world. That is what God's anger is and how it's different from humanity's anger. It's not an emotional outburst, but settled opposition against sin and evil in the world. And what we need to realize is that the wrath of God, his justice on the move to make things right, is a good thing. And we don't talk about it much. We like to focus on the love and the mercy 
And I'll get to that. But we need to understand the wrath of God and know that it is truly a good thing. Because there is a lot of evil in this world. And there are a lot of good people working hard to bring justice and to make things right. But there are things far beyond what we can control. Things that we don't even know about that are horrible things that are happening around the world. And the wrath of God will make it right. All of the evil things done, the human trafficking, uh, the, the evil things done to children, they're absolutely horrid. And God detests, detest, he hates it, all right? <laughs> I speak great words. And God's wrath will make it right. And that is what we want. But the thing is, we tend to not apply that to ourselves, or not want to at least. And Pastor John said this years ago, it's always stuck with me, that we judge other people by their actions, but ourselves by our intentions. So over there, yeah, they did terrible things, so they're bad people. But me, I do the same things, but I intend better, so I'm a better person. It doesn't apply to me. But we are guilty before God. Going all the way back to Adam and Eve in the garden, when they sinned, they, they rejected God, humanity then is born spiritually dead, but physically alive. That is our state, that we are spiritually separated from God. We're dead in that. And we have a physical death that we all will face at some point. And that is a result of sin. And so then you got to wonder, how does God's love and mercy come into play then? Exodus 34 says this, and this is God passing in front of Moses. This is an amazing scene. You can read about it in the whole chapter. And, and, and he's, God says this about himself. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. So God says of himself that he's compassionate and gracious. He's the best witness of himself. He said he is slow in anger, and he's abounding in love and faithfulness. Th that word there used when he says he's abounding in love, sometimes it's translated mercy. It's the Hebrew word has said, and it shows up throughout the Old Testament. Anytime that God says what he wants from us is, is loving mercy and faithfulness. It's all the same word. Anytime he describes himself in this way, and what it means is more than just love and what we think of like love and, oh, I love you, you're so nice. But it's mercy and it's loyalty and it's faithfulness. All of that wrapped up together is this word right here that God says he is abounding in. Eight times in the Old Testament it says this. God of himself or prophets say that God is abounding in this loving, faithfulness, mercy, loyalty. And that's what he truly wants from us. Not sacrifices, not our stuff, not any of that, but he wants us to love and follow him in the way that he abounds in over us. That's what God says of himself. And we have to look at that in view of the wrath of God. They're not separate things because we tend to have this like pendulum of like, we talk about God is wrathful and angry or God is loving and merciful, but he can't be both. He's one or the other, but that's not true. They're like sides of the same coin that complement one another. And it is because of the wrath of God that his love and his mercy is so amazing. Without the wrath of God, the love and the forgiveness of God is just nice sentiments. It lacks weight and meaning. And much of our cultural understanding of God today is so focused on his love without any concept of his wrath that we've created in our minds a picture of a morally neutral God that accepts and affirms everything in our lives, acting more like a divine cheerleader than a holy and righteous God. But when we focus on the love of God without his holiness, justice, and wrath, then we become stagnate in our faith. And we get stuck in our immorality, and then we wonder why we have no spiritual fruit. It's because we've forsaken the wrath of God and thinking God is fine with everything. But we have to seek morality in our life and growing towards God because it matters. And it's because of the wrath of God that his love and his forgiveness of us is amazing. So if there's no wrath, then it would just be whatever. It doesn't matter. But it does because of the wrath of God. And so that asks the question then of what do we truly deserve? The wrath of God or the love and the mercy of God? So I'm going to go through a lot of scriptures right now. Ephesians 2, verse 1 through 3 says this. The Apostle Paul writing in the early church. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. So he says that by nature we're deserving of wrath. Other translations will say we're the objects of wrath, of the wrath of God. So what that means is it's not a state that we sometimes are 
or a feeling or we made a mistake, now we deserve wrath. But it's who we are. We're born into this. We're not as like babies, like, I think I'm going to be evil with my life. That's what I've chosen. Like, it's not something we've chosen. It's something that we're born into, that we are spiritually dead, set before a physical death eventually, and we're objects of the wrath of God. Even more so, Scripture says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's not some have sinned, some have rejected God. It's all. We all have. And we see evil things on the news and evil out there. But if we're honest, there's evil inside of us too. And we've been raised and grown up in a culture with general Christian values. And so we have somewhat of a right and wrong that we kind of follow, but we still have evil with inside of us. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the wages of sin is death. It's like in a job, you work your job and the wages that you get, the payment you earn, it is for the job. For the sin in our life, we have earned death. That's what that means. That we are born spiritually dead and we have a physical death. That is the punishment that God enacted all the way in the beginning of Scripture for sin and rejection of Him. But let's get to the good news. What do we have in Christ? What do we get in Jesus? Ephesians 2. So that's what I read out of when it says that we are by nature deserving of wrath. That's verse 3. At the very next verse, verse 4, maybe 4 and 5 says this. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. So we were by nature deserving of wrath, but God in his love, who is rich in mercy, made us alive. But we're already physically alive. He's talking about a spiritual life. We're born again. That's what that comes from, that we are made alive in Christ through faith and trust in him and him taking the wrath of God in our place. Romans 5, 8 through 9 says this, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? So we've been justified by the blood of Christ because he shed his blood. He died on the cross where the wrath of God was poured out upon him. Our punishment, that we're guilty before God, but our punishment is put on Jesus. And what we get is Jesus' goodness, his perfection wrapped around us so that we can know God. So Jesus paid the price for us. He took the wrath of God upon himself. And so then we don't have the wrath of God on us anymore. That's why it says in Romans 8, 1, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. To be condemned means you are going to hell. In the biblical sense, that's what it means. We don't use that word a lot. We think about like a building that's condemned, it's going to be destroyed, they can't live in it anymore. Like that's what we were, but now through Christ we are no longer condemned. We have eternal life in him. We have a relationship with him. Jesus saved us from the wrath of God, and he saved us to a relationship with God. The wrath and the mercy of God meet at the cross. And so as a believer, we are no longer condemned, but instead we are embraced by our Heavenly Father through the sacrifice of Jesus in our place. That is the logical answer from Scripture, what it teaches, the mercy and the love and the faithfulness of God working together to redeem us. And you can know that, and you can... Spend a lot more time reading about that in Scripture, but you still can struggle with it in your heart. So now let me speak to the heart. How do we move past it? If we still have these feelings of being inadequate, of not being good enough for God to love, that I messed up again, there's no way that God wants me, what do we do with that struggle in our heart when we still think God is angry with us? The answer is simple, that we are to go to God. We fix our eyes on Jesus, that we pursue Jesus. But that's way easier said than done because of the emotional struggle of it. In Luke chapter 15, Jesus tells a parable, a story. He actually tells three. It's all about the same concept. But the most well-known from that is the prodigal son or the lost son. And Jesus in this is describing the heart of God for us. And many of you know this story, and I'll summarize it. There's a father that has two sons. And the younger son comes to him and says, hey, dad, I want my inheritance. What he's saying is, dad, I wish you were dead already so I could have your stuff. And the father, at great expense to himself, gives his son his inheritance. And that culture, what he could have done was had his son put in jail. He could have had him beaten or even killed for that insult. But the father gives him his inheritance and lets him go. What's the son do? He heads off to a distant country for what the scripture describes as wild living. You can fill in those blanks. 
He had a good old time with all the money he had, and he wasted all of it. And it says a famine hit that land. That's like an economic depression. And he's got nothing left. And he finds himself in a pigsty, so he's working to feed pigs. And Jesus is speaking to a Jewish audience that detested pigs, so it's actually like divine humor that he's making. And describing this Jewish boy now has lost everything, and he's trying to eat pig food to survive. And it is in that moment that he comes to his senses. We've all been in that place. He comes to his senses and he says, man, I I had it so good in my dad's house. I had food to eat, a place to sleep. He says, I'm going to go back and I'm going to beg my dad, can I just be a slave? Can I be a servant for you and work at your house? He's a distant country, so he's got a long way back. So he's walking back, filthy, covered with all this pig stuff, walking back. And he's practicing this speech. The scripture rehearses it. He's, he's saying, I'm, I'm going to say, I'm so sorry, Dad. I sinned against you and against heaven. Like, let me just please be a servant. He's going to beg his dad. And it says that when he's a long way off, it says that the father saw him on the road. I love that. You don't just notice things in a long off distance if you're not looking for it. The father says, sees his son down the road. He sees his son coming home. Filthy, covered, coming back home, his son. And what does the father do? Oh, he waits and he's angry and he's going to beat him when he comes back. No, the father runs to his son. Says that he took off running to his boy that was down the road. He didn't wait till he got back there. He didn't wait till he did his speech. He didn't make him earn it. He took off running for his boy. And I have this picture, you know, this is ancient times. They had like robe kind of things and like sandals. I picture this father just kind of hiking up his robe and he's running down that road to get to his boy. And in that day, the patriarchs did not hurry for anything. The meeting did not start until they got there. There was no need for them to run. It was undignified. But here's a father in complete lack of dignity running down the road at his son because he's excited and he sees his boy. And what's he do when he gets to him? Doesn't hit him, doesn't yell at him, doesn't start chewing him out. He gives him a hug. He would have been filthy and gross, but he gives a boy a, his boy a hug. And he says, put the robe on him, put the ring back on him, which meant that he was his son again. And the, the, the son, he's all, he, he tries his speech, oh, God, I've, I've, Dad, I've sinned against heaven against you. And, and the dad cuts him off. Doesn't make him beg. Doesn't make him earn his way back. He says, you're my son. And what's he do next? He throws a party, a big old celebration, because his son that was dead is now alive and back. <coughs> and then there's the older brother that gets all mad about it, and the father goes out to him, too, in the field. And says, come and be a part of this celebration because my son that was dead is now alive again. And you are always with me and everything I have is yours. That, that story, we tend to think of it as about the son being lost and being found. But really, it's about the heart of the father. And Jesus is teaching us about the heart of God. That would run out in complete lack of dignity to get his son, his child, and celebrate that he's been coming home. Does not make us beg? Does not make us earn our way back to prove that we're good enough? Because the reality is we're never going to be good enough because we're not held against our own standard of goodness. We're held against the perfection of God and we're not going to measure up. But Jesus measured up. Jesus paid it for us. Jesus died in our place so that his goodness is now given to us and so we can come back home to meet our father and he will run to us and he will celebrate you and he will throw a big party because his child has been found. We will never be adequate compared to the perfection of God, but through Jesus, we are more than enough. We are more than conquerors, Scripture says, and we are brought into the house, into the family of God, and we sit at his table, and we enjoy his goodness and his provision in our life because of Jesus. Not because we earned it, but because of Jesus. That is the heart of the Father for you. So you don't need to fear the anger of God. You need to care about righteousness and how you live, but you need to know that you can't save yourself any more than Jesus already did. It's already been paid. The wrath of God has already been poured out on Christ on the cross for you while you were still sinners, Scripture says, so that now you are part of the family of God. So now with our hands, we live that out. We live to to witness it to others, to tell them that, hey, God saved me and made me spiritually alive again that I have eternal life set before me, not because I earned it, not because I did more good than bad and God's going to let me in. No, but because Jesus did. And God met us where we were at and our filth on the road back towards him. And he reinstates you to his family. So is 
God angry? Yes. God is angry with the sin and the evil in the world. But as God's child, is God angry with you? No. He wants the best for you. And he wants you at his table in his house celebrating that you are home. So from our head to our heart to our hands, we live out this and we know that God is truly the God of second chances. We encourage you to pursue that in God and to trust that in God and to put your trust in Jesus who paid it all for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you this day for your grace and your goodness and your mercy. God, we thank you that your wrath is real, that the guilty will not go unpunished, that the evil things in this world will be made right because you are a righteous and holy God. And we thank you that your great patience and loving mercy, that you gave us life in Christ, that he saved us from hell and he saved us to you. Lord, help us to know that we are that son out on the road coming home and help us not to become the older brother in our own anger, but to know you and to celebrate with you and to celebrate others coming to faith in you, God. We thank you that Jesus paid it all for us. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.